Our next speaker is Nancy Canwisher from MIT. She's the, I had to get the piece of paper so I could remember that she's the Walter Rosenblith Professor of Cognitive Neuroscience at MIT. I think I first met you when you were maybe still a graduate student. You, you gave a talk at CogSci at MIT, which uh, blew me away. And I thought, all right, this is, this is some real talent here. Yeah, that was a long that time was, ago. That was nine years ago, yeah. That was a famous meeting. Um, she's famous, as many of you know, for the discovery and identification and uh, theorizing about the fusiform face area in the brain, but that's just one of many uh, discoveries she's made in cognitive neuroscience. Take it away, Nancy. Thanks, Dan. Hi, everyone. What a, what a fun thing to attend. Uh, I'm going to do less a presentation of a radical new idea than a spirited defense of a very old idea. Um, the idea of functional specificity in the human brain, an idea that I would not have thought would require that much defense until relatively recently when it seems to be um, you know, collecting a lot of criticisms or maybe it's just unfashionable, I don't know. Anyway, here we go. I think it's easy to forget uh, how far we've come in human cognitive neuroscience. So to better appreciate this, let me remind you where things stood uh, in 1957, year before I was born. This is a map that uh, the famous uh, Canadian neurosurgeon Wilder Penfield made of the human brain, and it gets a little hard to see in that, in that size, but he's got uh, about six different labels for different parts of the brain, the stuff you guys all probably know about, Broca's area for speech, visual stuff back here, and my favorite, interpretive. <laughs> okay, so that's roughly, you know, he, he did this toward the end of his career after spending all this time recording from different parts of the brain, and this is kind of the best he could do then. So if we skip ahead to around 1990, you can, with some imagination, draw some other kind of big, vague blobs on there from studies of patients with brain damage. It was clear that if you had damage to the back end of the right hemisphere, people sometimes develop difficulties with face recognition, and these language regions had been known for hundreds of years, and maybe some parietal regions were involved in attention. But that's basically pretty much what the map, of the functional map of the human brain looked like in 1990. And importantly, that could have been it, right? So it's hard to undo what we know since then, but it really wasn't a foregone conclusion that if you had a way to look in more detail, you'd find lots more functional structure. That could have been just kind of general purpose mush in the rest of the brain, right? So then functional MRI came around, and this is the picture of the brain today. So I'm gonna argue that that's actually very substantial, substantial progress. This is obviously very schematic. Uh, what I want to do is say uh, what this picture means, uh, why we should care about it, uh, and what's next. Okay, so that's the agenda. Okay, so uh, briefly, what does it mean? Okay, so if Dan can have a symphony from his sampled voice, I can show my own brain rotating in 3D. So um, there's me and some functional regions we found in my brain. Uh, and just to say uh, briefly what I mean, the idea of functional specificity in the human brain is that the human mind and brain contains a set of highly specialized components, each solving a different, pretty specific problem, some of them shown here in me. Um, each of those regions is present in essentially every normal person. This is just part of the basic architecture of the human brain. I would argue that's important, one, because these are just fundamental components of our minds. This is, in some sense, who we are, is that we are machines made with these particular components. Second, I think it's important because it, um, it sets out a, a, a research strategy where we can study these things and figure out um, what they do and follow them up, and I'll talk about how, what that street research strategy might look like. But first, I want to say a little bit more about what I mean by saying it's important. Some of these are sort of familiar old ideas, so you might think, okay, who cares? We've known since um, Broca and Wernicke that there are language regions, but let me remind you that some of these are remarkable and, and were not obvious. So for example, this little patch right there uh, is called the TPJ. It's a region where Rebecca Sachs and others, but especially Rebecca, have shown that that region is spectacularly selective. It's pretty much only active when you think about what another person is thinking. That's pretty astonishing. Nobody would have guessed that 20 years ago, and there it is. Even for these regions, like these language regions here that have been known since Broca and Wernicke, um, work with functional MRI, particularly by Ev Fedorenko, has shown that those regions are spectacularly selective. So if you identify those regions in each subject and you say, okay, here's, here are regions that respond when you understand the meaning of a sentence, that's high-level language processing. 
do, are those regions also engaged when you say listen to music or perform arithmetic or hold stuff in working memory? Um, and the answer to all of those questions is no, 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 no for everything that she and I have tested and every, pretty much everything you'd think of. They're just incredibly selective. Uh, and further, um, complementary work by Rosemary Varley in England has shown that patients with global aphasia who have massive left hemisphere strokes that pretty much obliterate their language abilities are actually preserved at all of those things. They can solve logic problems, they can do arithmetic, they can navigate in the ways that Liz Felke thought required language, although they don't. They can think about other people's thoughts and they can appreciate music. So to me, what that shows is um, not just some, you know, a map of the brain, this lives here and that lives there. Actually, it shows us an answer to a very long-standing deep question that everybody from a scientist to a philosopher to a layperson has wondered about. What is the relationship between thought and language? And I think these data tell us very clearly that for all the different things that you might make thinking mean, um, they're really di totally dissociable in the brain from language. Okay, so I think that's, these are things worth knowing. Okay, so what is the research program that's made possible uh, by this stuff? Oh, whoops, okay, we'll get to that in a second. First, I wanna uh, point out, some of you may be thinking, don't, isn't this view out of fashion? Or some of you may be thinking, why is she bothering to defend this? I actually don't know. All I know is that every time I turn around, more people are kind of arguing against this view. So here we have Joan Stiles saying, well, 30 years ago, the dominant model of neural function was strongly localizationist, but now neural network models conceptualize the function of a given region as integrally tied to the function of the network as a whole. Well, I'm not sure what that means, but it sounds kind of different. Uh, and we have uh, Lisa Feldman Barrett writing in a whole bunch of columns in the New York Times last summer. In general, the workings of the brain are not one-to-one, -one, whereby a given region has a distinct psychological purpose, and so forth and so on. This stuff is all over the place. Uh, so what's going on here? I think three things. One is, there actually is one set of empirical findings that does uh, amount to a significant challenge to this view, and I'll address it in a moment. Um, the second is um, there are a bunch of just standard methodological mistakes, and there's just no other word from them, leading people to draw just plain invalid inferences. This paper is an example. There are many, many. You could ask me later. I'm not going to go into the details now. Um, but the third thing is I think there's a lot of confusion about what functional specificity means. So I want to take a second to untangle it from some of the things it's often conflated with. Okay, so when I talk about functional specificity in the brain, what I mean is just simply there's some brain region X uh, that's only or primarily engaged and causally engaged in mental process Y. Okay, pretty simple idea. But people tend to get this confused with a whole bunch of other ideas. One is, well, are there several regions specifically engaged in process Y? So people often say, oh, well, you know, the face system, it's a distributed network, as if that means it's all mush. Really what it means is there are three or four very, each of them individually very functionally specific regions. And I would say in no way does that undercut the idea of functional specificity. It just says, okay, there's a few of them, so what? Um, second, the question of do other brain regions also play an important role in mental process Y? And the answer here is always, of course. No brain region could possibly act alone. It needs inputs of the right kind, and it needs to send outputs to other parts of the brain that can make use of that information, or else there'd be no point in having it. So everything, uh, every mental process uses mul mul multiple brain, re brain regions, and in no way does that undercut the question of the functional specificity of one of them in that system. Third related question is, oh, well, everything's connected. Well, of course everything's connected, right? Duh, right? But in no way does the fact that a particular brain region is connected to lots of other regions undercut or even engage in any way with the functional specificity of that region. Um, Next, does that region interact with other regions? Well, again, of course. If that region didn't interact with other regions, it wouldn't be of any use to us. But that's an orthogonal question to the question of the functional specificity of that region. Um, finally, people, people often conflate the idea of functional specificity with the idea of innateness. I think that's Jerry Fodor's fault, but anyway, I'm still suffering the baggage of modularity of mind. Um, and the point is, who knows? It's a really interesting question for each of those regions, but basically we don't know for any of them. We'd all love to know, and we don't know, and so we should shut up about it. It's a different question, right? Um, I mean, we should say something about it if we have something to say, but we shouldn't be confused with the, between the innateness and the specificity. Okay, so all of those are different things. I'm just talking about functional specificity, all right? Uh, so for example, the case of the fusiform face area, 
Uh, so here it is. Uh, if you've missed out on the last 20 years of functional neuroimaging, there it is in me and someone else. Uh, and what this thing does is respond very strongly to all, lots of different kinds of face images and respond less than half as much to lots of different kinds of other images of things that aren't faces, okay? So I think the evidence is very strong that that region is functionally select specific by that definition of responding a whole bunch more to faces than pretty much anything else. Um, but uh, now we get to the one, I think, serious, significant, uh, worthwhile criticism of this, of this idea. And this is a critique that's been put forth by Jim Haxby, probably many of you here know about this. What he's argued is that, so what if that region responds more to faces than anything else? That it's the information in that region that we should care about, okay? It's the, and in in what he has shown, uh, and many people including me have replicated, is that if you look at the pattern of response across those voxels in the fusiform face area, there is in fact some information about other things besides the faces, okay? So that's a serious challenge. It says, because, the brain's an information processing system, we should care about information, not just the magnitude of response. Um, so that's a real challenge. Uh, but what I would say is the key question here, and this is in some ways related to some of the things that uh, David Haig was saying, the key question is not just is there information in there that we as scientists can see if we look at that part of the brain and measure its response. The real question is what is the causal effect of that information? Is it used? Are other parts of the brain reading it out? So really what we need to know is, is that information used? Does it play a causal role in the perception of other things besides faces? So there's actually a lot of evidence that in fact it isn't, uh, but I'll show you some of my favorite, which is simply a videotape of a patient um, that uh, was made by some collaborators of mine a few months ago. This is a um, neurosurgery patient who's in Japan, so unfortunately it's in Japanese, but I have uh, subtitles at the bottom. Uh, and this guy has very bad epilepsy, and so he's had electrodes placed all over his brain, uh, and the surgeons are mapping out functions to try to uh, prepare for neurosurgery to try to take out the focus of the, um, of the seizure. And so what you'll see is um, uh, what they, they placed these electrodes right in the fusiform gyrus, they scanned him with functional MRI, they knew that two of those electrodes were right on top of the fusiform face area, that was validated in the experiments we did where they measured the response of those electrodes to phases and other things. They're very, very face selective. And now the question is, one, what is the causal role of that region in the perception, in perception? And two, especially, what is the causal role of that region in perception of other things besides faces? Okay, so I'll play the video. Okay, so here he is, and that, you can see he's getting zapped over there. Okay, he's looking at a box. なんか、アニメで、アニメでいくつもあったんじゃないかな。キャラクターの顔みたいな感じ。顔とか。はい。はい。口はそんなに変わってなかった。
Okay, you get the idea. So what it shows is that when he's looking at a face, stimulating that region disrupts and distorts the perception of the face. He sees a, an anime cartoon character, which is fascinating. But even more importantly, it has no effect on his perception of uh, the box and the soccer ball and the kanji, other than to put a face on top of it. So I think you couldn't ask for stronger evidence of the specificity of the causal role of this region. Uh, all it does is uh, produce face percepts. So I'd argue um, that all of this, the evidence is now very strong for functional specificity of uh, many of these regions in the human brain. And I think this is both a window into the architecture of the human mind, and that's pretty cool, but it's also a powerful research program that just invites a whole suite of other questions. And I realize I'm at risk of going over, so Dan, tell me when, I have, tell me when I have three minutes, and I'll, if I'm not done, I'll stop then. So, okay, okay, right. So we can ask, I'll do it super fast. We can ask, how do these things evolve? Really important question. Basically, we don't know, but the first thing I'd say is, well, not all of them did. Not all of, oh, good. Not all of them are products of uh, natural selection. So for example, this little region right here, the visual word form area, we and others have shown before that it responds strongly to words and letters strings in an orthography you know, uh, not in an orthography you don't. This is for subjects who read English, but not Hebrew or Chinese, much higher response to English letters than Hebrew or Chinese. Uh, that, that, the selectivity of that region cannot be the product of natural selection. It depends on that person's experience and the orthographies they know. So not all of these functional specificities are, um, are uh, uh, inherited or innate. Um, the second point is, um, is we can try to get some very initial clues about uh, evolutionary origins of different brain regions by looking for suspicious coincidences. So this is Rosa Lefer Souza, who's a grad student in my lab. And before she joined my lab, she and Bevel Conway um, produced this lovely functional image of a monkey brain. This is a side view, and what they showed is there are three bands of selectivity on the side of the temporal lobe of monkeys, um, where there's a band of face selectivity in purple, uh, and then color selectivity in blue, and then place selectivity in green. And when we did similar experiments in monkeys, we found that actually you get the very same ordering of face, color, place selectivity in the human brain, although in humans it's on the bottom surface of the temporal lobe, and in monkeys it's out on the side as if it got shoved around underneath. I think this is such a suspicious coincidence. It's such a weird, non-obvious um, arrangement of these selectivities that it looks to me like um, reasonably good evidence that these are homologous in the sense of inherited from a common ancestor. So mostly we don't know about evolution. Those are just a few beginning snippets, and there's some, in, some other possible inroads. The second obvious thing, the question that comes to mind when you just look at this picture is, how do you wire up one of these things in development? Here's all this systematic structure. It's really similar from one person to the next. How do you, how do you arrange for that to occur? Uh, and again, we don't really know. There's been uh, a lot of research, uh, including in my lab, scanning kids age four and five and up trying to figure out uh, what's in place by that age and how it changes after that. And there's a lot of debate about whether it continues to change until 10 or 15 or later uh, years of age. But in some sense, uh, there's a much more fundamental question, right? And that is, what does it look like in infancy? How early are those uh, regions present? Kids can do so much by even two years of age. What's really relevant is what happens in the first year. 
And um, very recently, Rebecca Sachs and her amazing team here, Ben Dean and Hillary Richardson and others, including Rebecca's son, Arthur, um, have been um, doing some spectacular functional neuroimaging. And after a seven-year effort, they finally figured out how to get good functional imaging data from six-month-old infants. And astonishingly, here's the data from one of their infants um, showing that the basic structure of face and scene selectivity that you see in adults is present by six months of age. Um, so for example, this is a six-month-old, and that's basically the parahippocampal place area responding to scenes. And here are some uh, well-known face selective regions that are known in adults. So I think that's pretty extraordinary. It doesn't tell us how development works. Uh, but it tells us, if it places a, a major constraint uh, on mechanisms of development that a lot of that spatial structure is present so early. Of course, we want to know not just when does the stuff arise, but how. Again, we don't know the answer, but there's some uh, interesting directions. One interesting idea is that of my postdoc, Zainab Sagan, um, who's been using diffusion imaging to get these connectivity maps of the brain. And her idea is that connectivity is set up first and that the patterns of connections instruct uh, the eventual pattern of functional development. And we don't know that for the general case, but there's one little teeny case where Zainab has some nice evidence. And that's the case of this visual word form area I mentioned. The cool thing about that is that, of course, people have that selectivity for words. Here's our data in an eight-year-old. After they've learned to read, but not before, of course. So this is the same data from the same kids registered to their five-year-old, their brain when they were five years old, showing that that same region was not selective for letters or words when the kid was five before they learned to read, and it became selective afterwards. So that's kind of nice. But more importantly, what Zainab can do is look at the pattern of connectivity in the five-year-old and predict exactly where in the brain that word form area will land in the eight-year-old when she registers her data. And that's consistent with the idea that prior connectivity instructs functional development. Uh, much more to be done, obviously, but that's a, that's a cool initial piece of evidence. OK, final question. Why these regions and apparently not others? We've looked and looked for lots of other things that we don't see. You don't just find a patch of brain for any old thing you look for. right? Lots of things that would have made sense, like predators and food and stuff like that. We don't see selectivity in the brain. So I don't know the answer to that. I think it's really fascinating. Um, but um, I think we can ask it by asking, what other things do we find? So I'll just end by describing very briefly, a uh, recent line of work where we've taken a very different approach. So um, the, the limitation of everything we've done before, where we sit around and think up hypotheses, just make them up and then go test them. On the one hand, that's what good scientists are supposed to do, come up with hypotheses and test them. Uh, and I used to think people who did anything else just you know, didn't have ideas. Uh, but I've come around. Uh, and the reason that it's important to do other things is what if the important aspects of brain organization are just not things we would think up to test, right? And so I think we need to complement our hypothesis-driven methods with ways of just collecting big heaps of data and using fancy math to shake the data and tell us what the structure is without importing our hypotheses. So we've been doing that in auditory cortex. I'll skip over some stuff. We is Sam Norman Higner and Josh McDermott. Um, and we've been scanning subjects while they listen to lots of different kinds of natural sounds, um, like it's these. It's supposed to either rain or snow. So these are just common two-second clips of sounds that are easily recognizable. Hannah are is good at chosen because they're the most commonly heard sounds that, that people know and recognize. <coughs> so we scan people listening to those sounds. We then collect from all of kind of greater suburban auditory cortex back here. From each of those voxels, we get the magnitude of response of each voxel to each of the 165 sounds. And so what we end up with is, across 10 subjects, a big matrix, 165 sounds by 11,000 voxels. Then what we do is throw away the labels in the matrix. Now we just have the data. No hypotheses, no nothing. No knowledge about where those voxels are, how they're arranged spatially, or what the labels are of the sounds. And then we just use some math, in this case, a variant of independent component analysis that basically says, tell us what the dominant structure is in these data, whatever it is. And amazingly, the stuff that comes out is really interpretable. Six components emerge that account for over 80% of the replicable variants. And the first four are sort of known acoustic things that make sense, like selectivity for high frequency and low frequency. That's tonotopic cortex. That's been known for decades. It's a nice positive control. Um, the interesting thing is the other two components that came out, 
Um, here's one of my favorites. Uh, so this is now the, um, the 165 different sounds rank ordered by their magnitude of response in that component. Now let's add some category labels for the kinds of sounds of each of these things. And you can see there's a lot of light green and dark green. So if we average over those, this region responds strongly to speech sounds. But it's not language in the sense of high level language understanding, because it responds at least as much to foreign speech that the subjects don't understand. It also responds pretty strongly to um, vocal music that has lyrics and much less to everything else. So that region is pretty clearly a speech processing region. And other people have seen stuff like that before. This isn't 100% novel, but it's a lovely way to kind of discover it by, by pure uh, structure discovery. The last region I'll mention is one that hasn't been reported before. Here it is, component six. And there's lots of light blue and purple. And when you put the labels back on, you see, wow, the things that produce the strong responses here are all music. Instrumental music, vocal music, it doesn't matter if it's a salsa band or a classical flute solo, a person singing, or a drum roll. All of those things produce a strong response in that component. Uh, and everything else produces a much lower response. And so that's a music selective response. And this has not really been seen before. Uh, importantly, our subjects were not trained musicians. I love that because this is just, this is not something that happens under special circumstances. This is part of the basic machinery we all share. Um, and I also think it's cool because no one even knows why we have music. I'm sure Steve and Ray have lots more to say on this than I do. Uh, well, people say lots of things, but I think there's one thing we can conclude from this, which is music is not just a byproduct of having other machinery in the brain. It's not just like, okay, we have speech stuff and we need that and we know why we have speech and language. And once we have a speech processing system, we can co-opt it and get it to process music. No, music is not engaging the speech system. It's completely separate. It's its own separate thing in the brain. So I think that really constrains a lot uh, about how we think about music. Okay, I'm gonna skip the spatial arrangement. They're in different places, who cares? Uh, so this is just supposed to sketch some of the uh, I think very exciting research directions that follow just from this simple picture of the brain, um, figuring out how it evolves, how, it wired, how it's wired up, what it's connected to, how it develops, uh, and which functions may be um, uniquely human, like those for speech. Thank you, Nancy. You can, you can take your own questions. I had uh, just one question. The Varley paper that dissociates thought from language in a, in a global aphasic, yeah. what, are their, what are their tests for thought? OK, so this is Rosemary Varley's research program. She's been doing it for 20 years. And she's done pretty much everything you'd think of. Uh, arithmetic, logic, um, classic theory of mind, like Sally Ann tasks. Um, uh, reorientation, that's the part of navigation that Spelke thinks requires language. Yeah. Um, I'm probably forgetting something. I mean, okay. you know, pretty much everything you'd think of. And of course, you have to do it in subtle ways to try to get them to understand it. But, you know, they're not dumb. They just don't have language. That's the amazing thing. Most recently, um, Ev Fedorenko and I were sitting around thinking, okay, what is it? What is like, there must be some parts of thought that require language. I mean, it feels like some things are really close to language. And so I said, well, what about who does what to whom, right? Isn't that the essence of language, who does what to whom? And so we uh, constructed, or we had an artist construct a whole set of pictures in which the thematic roles were reversed. So you either have a picture of a shark biting a man or a man biting a shark. Um, and Rosemary showed those to her global aphasics. No problem. They absolutely know which one makes sense and which one doesn't. So thematic roles are perfectly intact as well. I want to take other questions, so thank you. Yeah. Okay. Uh, thank you for that lovely paper, lovely talk. One question, um, I love the list of different ways in which the uh, rejection of functional specificity is misunderstood. Uh, would you comment on the idea of regional contiguity, the idea that a region is a, is a thing? Um, and just to say how- Like how a natural kind that. or something. No, more like it's a, it, it's a place, that it has a boundary and that it's a single brain yeah. region rather than a distributed component like in your independent component analysis. Yeah. Well, so um, what, what comes from this, re I mean, this is a little bit, you know, this is from a TED talk, we simplified a little bit, we cheated slightly, but not a lot. 
right? The sense in which we cheat it is, of course, when you get an activation map, you set a threshold to, to decide what thing am I going to color in pink and what am I not, right? And it's not like once you go beyond the edge of that threshold, there's nothing. On the other hand, the, it, we've occasionally measured this and asked, okay, if you look, like if you define the fusiform face area, and now you draw, it's you know, on the cortical surface, so it's flat, right? Flatten it out. And now you ask with increasing ovals drawn around it, how far out do you have to go before you lose that selectivity? It's about four millimeters. It's not very far. Four millimeters out, there's no selectivity for faces over objects. Um, so, so they're not super sharp, they're not buttes, but they're not, you know, they're, they're more like western mountains than eastern mountains. Quickly then, does anything exclude though uh, what you refer to as a region or area actually occupying four or five distinct locations? No, no, that was one of my main points, is okay. that there's, I see, I mean it seems to me completely unsurprising and unproblematic if one neural system has either a bunch of um, components that we may someday later discover how they're different from each other, or even if they're all doing the same thing, there's, it's no big deal if they're separated in different bits. We have a question over there. Uh, what did you find uh, about spatial arrangement? What was the brain's response? Just, you skipped that slide. Oh, right. I know. Just a quick. Yeah, so the, um, these green bits here, well, you can't, right there, they're sort of up in a sulcus, so they don't really show, they're actually really big. Um, that's a region that we found uh, way back in 1998 and uh, named the perihippocampal place area. It lives in perihippocampal cortex, and it responds whenever you look at pictures of places. And we spend a lot of time saying what has to be in the place by taking stuff in and out. And it turns out all that has to be in the place is spatial layout, a ground plane, a barrier, walls. The more complex your spatial layout, the more that region tends to go. And all of these things have been uh, found, all, not all of these, but many of these, including the face, place, and body regions, have been found subsequently in macaque cortex, where you can actually stick electrodes in, record from individual neurons, and really characterize the whole neural population response. And so there are several papers now that have uh, beautiful characterization of the neural population responses to places, showing you know, it really is very much walls and borders and boundaries. Thank you. Yes, I'm interested in how your work um, either supports or refutes some of Dehane's work on the visual word form area, specifically the finding that the right fusiform gyrus will do more work for facial recognition after letters have been developed in the visual word form area. Yeah, we've tested that recently, and it's not true. In fact, I showed you the data. I didn't make a deal of it, but I mean, it's a perfectly fine hypothesis. It just isn't true. Um, uh, let me see if I can find those data. Um, so in, in Zainab Sagan's data, where she's looking at the development of the visual word form area, which we chose just because it's the only cortical region where we, where we can scan kids before and after, it develops late enough that you can catch it before. That's why we chose it, but while we're at it, it can also answer some other questions. Where'd it go? We're getting there. Okay, so here is a visual uh, word form area at age eight, and this is, yeah, I didn't tell you what all the labels were. This is a response to visually presented words, and this is faces and um, scrambled words and objects. This is at age five, faces, uh, letters, and false fonts, which is scrambled letters. So there's no, you know, so th their, their hypothesis is Actually, Stan's hypothesis, I think, was that it was object shape selective before. Yeah. Marlene Behrman's is that it was face selective before. Neither is true. Right. Yeah. Thank you. And of course, another teacher. laboratory for testing the, yeah. uh, the, uh, the hypothesis of that speech and language, are, uh, that um, um, thought and language are essentially orthogonal, uh, is the uh, congenitally profoundly deaf in regions where a sign language isn't available. Uh, my colleague at UConn, uh, uh, Coppola, has been studying these uh, people in Nicaragua, which is a place where schools for the deaf develop very slowly. And I, I think it, it gives good support to the, the hypothesis. Except you mean, in, you mean in the sense that those are kids who are raised without normal in, language, and in, yet they can think. In the sense fine. that people who okay. who are they do it, they uh, have do no, invent their own pigeons, though, right? Or they own they do some pigeon signing, but uh, um, they th these people are able to function pr pretty well in society. They can do, do I mean jobs. They can be uh, even small-time vendors. Those who are small-time vendors, they they discovered were uh, 
very poor at uh, making change. And, then, and that observation led to some more uh, systematic studies of the um, uh, counting and arithmetic, arithmetic abilities of these people, and uh, they were very, very poor. So that's one area where there might be yeah, so let me just say, I think, I think it's perfectly possible and indeed plausible that language plays a very important developmental role in teaching you how to think and in, in the development of the whole mind. The question here is just, once you're an adult and you have your whole system in place, are you then relying on your language system to think in? So that's the, that's the idea that I'm suggesting these data challenge. It makes sense to me that connectivity would predict the uh, functional specialization because ultimately, what is a slab of cortex doing? It's getting some kinds of information in, transforming it, sending it out to some other area that makes use of it. Um, are there any other uh, rationales for why you might expect that kind of functional specificity in the cortex itself? Like, are there cytoarchitectonic differences that would, that or, or the modern equivalent of kind of Brodmann areas with our better technologies that would predict where the boundaries are or what. Um, there's also a, a, um, a widespread idea that cortex is completely interchangeable, and so there'd be no reason to expect the internal computations in the gray matter to uh, in any way be specialized for different tasks. But I assume that that's an, a, a simplification too. Do we know anything about the cytoarchitectonics that would predict what, uh, in addition to connectivity, what area would, specify, would specialize in what function? It's a great question. I've been dying to know the answer to that for 15 years. And here's the problem. There are a number of people who look in great detail at the histology of postmortem brains, like Katrin Amens and Carl Zillis in Germany, who have this set of 20 brains. And they have just analyzed them in spectacular quantitative detail. Um, with you know, uh, receptor fingerprints and histology and everything you could possibly want. The problem is that the precise location of these regions vary from subject to subject. Oh, and they're dead. And they're dead. So what we need is in vivo function and ex vivo architecture. And essentially, we don't have that. There's one possible exception. Very recently, Colony Grospector at Stanford has argued that actually you can predict exactly where the fusiform face area is going to land with respect to a tiny little sulcus that I never noticed before, but she and her uh, grad student, Kevin Weiner, found, it runs down the middle of the fusiform gyrus. It's called the mid-fusiform sulcus. And Colleen's argument is the fusiform face area lands in a very specific location with respect to that sulcus. Relevance being, you can find that sulcus in postmortem brains. So they have a paper last year or so where they argued that there are cytoarchitectonic distinctions between the fusiform face area and neighboring cortex. I think it's early days. I think it's a heroic effort. Good for them. I'm not sure it's nailed yet, but it's a, it's a really important question. Do, do those postmortem studies um, just bear on the hypothesis that uh, cortex is completely interchangeable at the histological level? They, I mean, they do. That's... And so, you know, the Katrin Amens and Carl Zillis' stuff shows all these fine-grained subdivisions. It's like, you know, Brodmann on steroids, right? Mm -hmm. But, but actually, when you look at the, you know, I'm not a neuroanatomist, to put it mildly. When I look at those figures and they say, oh, see, here's the border between that and that, I look, I can't see a damn thing. So, you know, they have quantitative methods, and they're doing it very carefully to quantify, you know, it's basically the brightness of the tissue as you go across a, the layers of the cortex. And they have some quantitative way to say, when does that change? And I believe them. I think they're doing it right. But when you look at it, it's not very impressive. But whether, you know, visually impressive histology to us has anything to do with relevant circuit structure, who knows? Yeah. Thanks very much, Nancy. That was wonderful.